Okay. Uh, thank you, Seb. So this tutorial will uh, divide it in two parts. I first present to you a few slides in order to have an overview and to recap all the concepts that you saw in the past uh, lectures that you need to uh, understand the pipeline that we will propose to you to um, compute the effective connectivity. Uh, so uh, you saw in the, in the last lecture and the last tutorial that uh, functional brain networks are a complex dynamic system that can describe either sensory, cognitive or motor processes. And uh, these uh, uh, dynamical brain networks evolve at a millisecond scale. So, so here I reported a brief scheme on uh, what about it was uh, our synergy product, a project that led to the summer school and also about the output of a tutorial free of yesterday of Isotta and uh, Nicola. And uh, as you see um, in this uh, slide, we uh, started from uh, our brain and uh, we propose uh, to you different modalities uh, to study the brain. So the anatomical perceleation, and you saw that there are a lot of uh, different kind of perceleation that can be based on anatomy, but also on function. And uh, uh, you saw um, some imaging data that we can apply to these uh, uh, to the structural pro uh, properties of the brains, like DTI, DCI, and so on, to obtain uh, a structural brain networks. So on the other side, one technique to study function in the brain is the IDSPG, or as you see in uh, also the fMRI. And uh, what uh, Isat and Nicolau um, tried yesterday to do was uh, to clean up the identity G from the main artifacts so that wasn't enough time to show you all the topography and all the artifacts that we can remove from uh, uh, the G, but at least uh, you have some indication about it. And then uh, you saw um, how to co-register the uh, source uh, estimate uh, points that uh, a lie in the gray matter of the brain with the R structural MRI. So, and the output of the tutorial of Isotta and Nicola uh, using a particular perceleation of our brain was uh, to estimate one time series that uh, is explained in the source waveform uh, in each brain uh, region of interest. And uh, in our tutorial today, we will start from uh, the output of tutorial three, so this uh, uh, estimation of uh, the source waveforms, and we will try to estimate a functional brain network. So here I uh, reported uh, the different time, um, uh, scheme about the brain connectivity middle. And it's quite important that uh, you uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, brain connectivity can refer to different patterns between distinct units uh, of the, in the nervous system. And we can um, talk about uh, anatomical links, uh, that is example of a structure and diffusion uh, lecture, and uh, the non-anatomical links are about the wet matter. And so there, there is no directionality. And uh, you should learn that all the matrix that uh, are reporting structural connectivity are sy uh, symmetric along uh, the main uh, the diagonal. And uh, mm, uh, because, uh, as I said, uh, there is no direction information. And uh, usually the changes to this uh, structural matrix are, are quite slow because are usually due to brain plasticity. Then we can um, talk about functional and effective connectivity. So we can talk about the statistical dependencies between these different units of the brain area. And we can also study the causal interaction between these units. And in this tutorial, we will start, we will study brain connectivity. Then we will try to assess also directionality and we will base our modeling on Granger causality. And uh, thanks uh, to the talk of ICE, uh, he and uh, David, uh, they give to you the basics uh, about uh, Granger causality. And we saw that uh, uh, Granger causality has been applied to both uh, EG signal, but also to functional MRI signal during uh, both uh, behavioral and cognitive tasks, but also in resting state in reality. 
And uh, as, I, as uh, I said, uh, granular causality is a statistical concept of causality that is based uh, on prediction. And here I reported, in order to recover the main uh, aim of granular causality, I reported uh, this uh, uh, toy example in which we have uh, these uh, three brain regions, uh, region A, region B, and region C. And we have the, to imagine that the only true direct connection are the one that uh, are represented by the gray arrows. While uh, the green arrows is represented the undirect, undirect connection between uh, B and C. So, um, uh, and we know that uh, the uh, signal B is uh, Granger causes uh, the signal A if, uh, as uh, uh, was said by David and uh, I, so the past values that are containing in the signal B contain information that help to predict the present value of the signal A above and beyond the information contained in the past values of A alone. So this is the basic concept in which is based Granger causality that for the first time was applied to uh, the economic methods and then was translated to neuroscience. And then uh, as um, I and David said, there are uh, some limitations, of course, uh, of uh, the uh, Granger causality uh, application. One of the limitations of Granger causality is uh, that is defined in the time domain. Indeed, uh, some extension of uh, this method were to propose uh, some methods that were based on the same concept of Granger causality, but uh, were applied to the frequency domain. And uh, the Two most common methods and well known methods that uh, were applied to uh, this concept of Granger causality in the frequency domain are the direct transfer function and the partial direct equivalence. The main uh, difference between uh, uh, these uh, uh, two methods is that uh, direct transfer function describes the causal influence between uh, two channels. So direct transfer function, if we apply to our DTF, to our toy example, is also estimated a connection between the signal B and C. Because uh, in, as uh, the data uh, data transfer function uh, is uh, developed, uh, he found also the undirected uh, causal uh, inferences between two signals. Because we, we can see that in reality, the time series uh, represented by the region C is Granger causes by the time series in B because of the connection that they have through the time series in A. While the PDC should estimate only the direct influences, so only the uh, gray, our gray arrows. So this is the main uh, differences between two techniques. But as I said, um, it depends uh, in uh, my answer to the Slack uh, questions. It depends on the application. For instance, uh, um, I'm thinking about when we want to find the focus uh, in uh, epileptic patients. So uh, probably uh, the DTF function is uh, better to use in that case if we want to found the source of that epileptic activity. Uh, because he is concentrating the information about uh, the, the FOCI, okay, the, let's say the hub of our network, the main hub, the main source. While PDC can be uh, applied to, uh, to other uh, uh, experimental setup. And in this tutorial, we will apply, so um, we will apply mainly um, the PDC. And uh, you will find also in the toolbox that we will present uh, uh, all the uh, extension of uh, uh, the PDC methods. Uh, so as you saw um, in uh, the ads presentation, present the square PDC, but there are other like information PDC and so on. So of course, uh, we have to keep in mind uh, as I already said, that every time that we are applying some middles, so we are choosing uh, some parameters, uh, we are imposing some uh, a priori assumption uh, to our experimental data. And uh, is uh, what uh, we do with uh, also applying this uh, time, time varying connectivity estimation. So our uh, main hypothesis is that the cortical sources that uh, were computed from the G data and the cortical sources are the time series that were estimated in tutorial three by Isot and Nicola. 
generate a collection of a realization of a stochastic process. And this uh, sto stochastic process, as you briefly saw in the talk of uh, Ais and David, is uh, um, described by a multivariate multi-trial time series. Why multivariate? Multivariate because we saw that uh, he, uh, we can represent our signal by an autoregressive model. So uh, we saw that uh, we are predicting the current state of our signal like a linear combination of the past values of the signal itself and the past value of all the other signals. Multi-trial because uh, in uh, some experiment like uh, uh, the visual evoked potential setup that was uh, shared for uh, this uh, summer school, we have a lot of trial of the same events. So the subject um, we perceive the same stimulus a lot, a lot of times. So we have a lot of answers of the same um, event. And of course, uh, is also um, changing over time. Okay, so we suppose that uh, our weights of our autoregressive uh, um, model here, our way, here the um, variable y is representing our signals, so our time series, the variable k, the time, and uh, the variable x is representing the weight, so the autoregressive coefficient. And what we want to estimate are the weights of uh, um, this model, because of course uh, uh, we have uh, the, the measurement, okay? We have our uh, cortical source waveforms in our hand. Um, and here you can see that there is a main parameter to set, and this main parameter is uh, the P, the P order, the model order. Uh, the model order is the amount of past information chosen to best predict uh, the signals. What does it mean? It means uh, uh, how many steps we go uh, in the past in order to uh, predict our present values, okay? And uh, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, to choose uh, a, a value, otherwise we are unable to uh, solve uh, with our PC <laughs> the, the model. And uh, as I said, uh, we are interested, uh, and I will go back, uh, in estimating this uh, coefficient, uh, as you saw in the presentation of David, but we know that the uh, brain processes are, uh, are non-stationary process. What does it mean? Uh, simply, we can note that the mean and standardization of our EG signal are not constant over time, because uh, if something happens, the information is changing, and the statistical properties of our signals are changing over time. So it's why we want to estimate this time varying connectivity. So we want to have an estimation how, on how these uh, autoregressive uh, uh, weights um, are changing over time. In order to do that, as David said, um, often these uh, applied the uh, and uh, scientists use uh, the uh, Kalman filter formulation. And uh, the Kalman filtering applied to these uh, time varying connectivity algorithms uh, is based on uh, two steps, the one in blue, so the prediction phase, and the one uh, in uh, um, orange, the uh, update phase. And uh, what is happening? So we are, uh, so what we want to estimate? We want to estimate the autoregress autoregressive coefficients. And uh, the autoregressive coefficient uh, usually in uh, the main application of the Kalman filter are uh, estimated like uh, a random walk. So uh, the uh, auto autoregressive coefficient at times k is equal at the autoregressive coefficient at time k minus one plus uh, some noise. And then from this uh, uh, prediction, but we, uh, we uh, can estimate our uh, Okay, our present state of our signal. But we can um, compare our prediction, okay, so of our prediction of the signal with the signal itself. And comparing with it, we can decide how to uh, weight 
our Q prediction and how we want uh, to follow our measurement. And to find the trade off uh, between uh, uh, these uh, two estimations, so the, the estimation, the pure estimation and the measurement, we have to set the Kalman gain. The Kalman gain. So the role of the Kalman gain is uh, decide how much we want to follow the data and how much we want to follow our uh, prediction. And uh, in this recursive uh, way, we can uh, um, estimate the, uh, our state variables that our autoregressive coefficient, and then manipulating our autoregressive coefficient, then uh, we can apply um, uh, the other algorithm to estimate all the connectivity matrices. And today, as I said, that we will uh, uh, see the application of the SPDC that was the one that was presented by ICE. So uh, just to keep in mind and remember one of your question when uh, you were asking the kind of uh, connectivity uh, measure to use uh, with your data. As I said, it depends on your data. And uh, as I said, also, it depends on, also on your ability to be able to set the parameters that uh, all these, uh, these algorithms need. For instance, in applying this kind of algorithm based on the Kalman filtering, we have to set the p order of our multivariate autoregressive model. And there are a lot of parsimonial criteria in order to set the p order, like the well known AKIK criteria. And then uh, the other parameter to set uh, if uh, we want a time varying uh, uh, estimation uh, is uh, the gain of the Kalman filter. The game of the Calvin filter mainly depends on an adaptation constant uh, that uh, is uh, weighting, as I said, how much we want to trust the measurement and how much we want to trust this prediction. And uh, in the first part uh, of uh, the code, MATLAB code uh, that uh, Yana will present to you, you uh, we see that in calling the implementation of uh, uh, the Kalman filtering, so this uh, time varying uh, Kalman filter connectivity, uh, we, we have to set a value for our adaptation constant and a value for our uh, p order. So that it will be this p value and this uh, adaptation constant. And the input of our function, of course, will be our data, this uh, variable temp, that uh, will be our 3D. Uh, matrix uh, in which we will have in one dimension all the trials. As I said, we have this uh, um, experiment that David uh, described in uh, one of the last slides of his presentation. So we have a lot of re realization of the same process. Uh, um, and then uh, uh, we have the time series that Isotta and Nicola uh, estimated. So we have a uh, um, signal for each uh, region of interest uh, in our brain uh, that, of course, uh, that these time series are defined in the time domain. So with the uh, uh, and then we will see the application of uh, the um, uh, this uh, uh, definition of the Kalman filter, okay, to our uh, um, source time series. And then we will see how this um, how from these results we can also compute the connectivity matrix. But uh, as I said, the Granger causality has some limitations. Some of these limitations, for instance, that uh, the definition of Granger causality was only defined in time, so that was extended with uh, some uh, frequency indicators. Then um, another limitation of these uh, Granger causality indicators uh, is that uh, they suppose that the signal was stationary. And in order to overcome this, this limitation, there were the implementation based on the Kalman filtering to have some autoregressive coefficients that are changing over time, like uh, our brain signals and our brain networks. Um, and uh, I um, also uh, said to you that we have two main parameters to set. Uh, one of these is uh, the p order. And uh, uh, because the um, autoregressive model uh, were modelized uh, a lot of decades ago. As I said, there are a lot of parsimonial criteria that were offered to have an indication of uh, uh, the value to give to this uh, uh, model order. And the other um, parameter to set is uh, the Kalman gain. Of course, uh, 
in the um, implementation of uh, the time varying connectivity based on the Kalman filter, the um, gain of uh, uh, the Kalman filter is a constant over time. And uh, maybe uh, having this uh, constant parameter over time is not uh, the best choice. Uh, of course, uh, for instance, if uh, we are also analyzing the brain connectivity in a evoked potential, of course, what is happening before the stimulus, um, the signal is changing in a, a different way uh, respect to when we have the response of uh, this uh, evoked activity. So uh, because of that, uh, we have the idea uh, to implement uh, this uh, self-tuning optimized Kalman filter that uh, is uh, self-tuning the um, speed of the of adaptation of the filter. In order to do that, uh, is looking at different windows of our data comparing to the uh, last values that we have uh, predicted, we have estimated, in order to see how um, our uh, estimation are uh, able to track uh, changes in our data. So we take out one parameter to set, and this parameter to set that we take out was the uh, uh, this coefficient of the updatation of the Kalman filter that was self-tune uh, during the implementation. And then the, it was the idea that was also presented by David. And let me also use some uh, um, example of application. And we will see, of course, also in our data that uh, in the same uh, uh, toolbox, we can find uh, the implementation also of uh, the stock filter. And we can see that the main difference is that is in input, uh, we have only, of, of course, to give our data that are organized in a 3D matrix. And then uh, we have only to give uh, um, to the function the order of uh, our multivariate autoregressive model. So um, then uh, from uh, all the lecture about uh, tractography and uh, diffusion, uh, we uh, also um, saw that uh, the main uh, problem, let's say problem, uh, but the main challenge of uh, um, the estimation in, in the estimation of a structural network is that uh, we have a lot of uh, false positive. Uh, so our idea in uh, uh, integrating a prior in uh, the implementation of uh, the stock algorithm was uh, to uh, take care mainly of, uh, let's say, all these uh, dark blue regions. So uh, we uh, trust mainly uh, from this uh, structural prior, where uh, the uh, expert in uh, uh, structural networks say to us that cannot be a direct uh, uh, direct fibers, a direct connection between uh, two brain regions. And uh, we will try to, let's say, clean our estimation um, following uh, the information uh, given by the uh, structural network in all, uh, um, in all the position in which we uh, can find a direct interaction. Okay, and uh, uh, was, uh, for instance, the example that also you saw in the David lecture, in which uh, in our model, uh, a source was neglected. So uh, we, uh, in order to avoid to uh, estimate that connection that in reality was indirect, we can clean our results, let's say, introducing a structural prior. So, um, all uh, the implementation of these uh, three methods. Uh, so the first one, the time varying connectivity that uh, starts from uh, the implementation of a ca the Kalman filter, then the uh, introduction of this uh, uh, self-tuning uh, uh, optimization of the uh, of adaptation constant of the Kalman gain. And then also the um, introduction of a structural prior of in uh, our connectivity estimation can be found. Let me see, I have to change my screen if I'm able, sorry guys. It can be found in the toolbox that uh, I, uh, in which we share the link and I would like to show you the toolbox if I'm able to change the screen. Okay. Okay. 
So now you see my screen. It's a bit a mess. Are you able to see my screen now? I suppose yes. Okay, so yes, here yes. is okay. So here you can find in GitHub the Dynet toolbox. So that is the toolbox that is containing all this function. And here in the readme file, you can find a uh, more introduction, okay, to the use of uh, this uh, toolbox. And as you can see, it's organized in uh, different folders, uh, and uh, each uh, folder contains the main function that uh, you need to uh, run uh, run the code, and uh, in particular, run the code that was uh, uh, proposed in class. So the um, Kalman filter for the state space modeling on the physiological time series that was the first one that was presented. Then uh, the um, revision of uh, this method with uh, this uh, self-tuning optimizing Kalman filter, and then uh, the introduction of uh, a structural prior. Then uh, in um, the connectivity folder, we uh, can find uh, mainly the uh, in this uh, first function, the way to, from our, our estimation of our autoregressive, autoregressive coefficient that uh, are changing uh, uh, over time, uh, the uh, estimation of PDC and uh, other extension of uh, uh, the PDC algorithms, and then uh, a few ways in order to visualize also these uh, connections. And then uh, there is also a folder uh, dedicated to simulation in order to try to uh, simulate some uh, uh, toy example and evaluate all these methodologies. And then in the utilities, uh, there are uh, all the invoked functions that you need uh, in order to run uh, properly the code. And you can freely download the, the code. And uh, now I think I will let the stage to Yolan to show you how to implement all this stuff in, on the MATLAB. So I will mute myself. All right. Uh, thanks, Maria, for uh, the introduction. Um, I will also share my screen. Uh, can you all hear me and see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'm Jolan and I will guide you through the second part of this tutorial session on the dynamic functional connectivity and how to include uh, information from structural connectivity to guide the functional connectivity to those connections um, that seem to be more uh, biologically plausible. Um, so for this uh, tutorial session, we have prepared a MATLAB live script um, that I will go over together with you. Um, if you don't have uh, the script yet, you can find it on uh, the link that I just sent now in the chat. Um, so if you go to that website, you can find two links. One of them is to the presentation that Maria just gave, and the other one gives you an uh, HTML version of the MATLAB script that we are going to go over right now. Um, and uh, okay, so let's start with um, the code. Um, so in this session, we will analyze, as Maria already mentioned, uh, the output from the last tutorial session from Nicola and Isotta, where uh, you reconstructed the um, source time series uh, in the brain based on the scalp EEG. Um, and we will use the same data, oh, the same data sets. Uh, Sorry. Um, we will use the same data set here. So um, <clears throat> we are using the VEPCON uh, data set, which contains uh, several trials where the patients are uh, presented with images either of uh, faces or scrambled faces. And uh, then we, re we record the evoked potentials um, for each of the conditions. And if we load the data set, we have a structure with several fields. And the most important fields uh, or the fields of, of interest for us are mainly uh, the trial field, which contains all the time series for the different trials. Uh, so this contains uh, different matrices for each trial. So 587 trials. We have a matrix of uh, 72 regions of interest uh, by uh, 625 time points of the measurements. Uh, each trial lasts two and a half seconds at a sampling rate of 250 hertz. 
Um, there's also um, a time field which contains uh, the time vectors for each evoked potential. Uh, we have a label field which contains the labels of each region of interest. And then uh, the trial info, which gives us information on whether the uh, presented image was a face or a scrambled face. So in trial info, you get a zero if uh, the trial contains a scrambled face and one if it's a face image that was presented. Um, in this uh, tutorial session, we will focus only on the face trials, um, but we recommend you to um, go over the code again afterwards, uh, play a bit with the parameters, and then maybe also look at the other trial types to see how it affects the results uh, to get a better feeling of how the pipeline works. Um, so in the first step, we will uh, select only the phase trials. The, that's what we do here in this for loop. And then uh, once we have extracted the correct time series, we will look at uh, the average uh, evoked potential of all the uh, phase trials. Um, so that's that's what we get here. So if we take a look at the figure, uh, let me just move, can I move this? Yeah. Um, so what we see here is the average evoked potential of, for all the um, um, phase trials. We don't see the, any window. We only see the, the live script. Ah, that's uh, annoying. Then let's. Maybe you need to share the desktop. Your yeah, entire... that's yeah. indeed what I'm gonna. It's easier. <laughs> uh, can you see my desktop now? Yeah. Okay, then this is a figure that uh, we should be seeing. Um, so if we take a look here, we see a long pre stimulus period. Here at uh, time zero, the image is presented. And then we can see the typical uh, event related potentials here uh, with two main peaks, a short peak in the beginning, which is uh, likely to be just the arrival of the visual stimulus and then a second broader peak, uh, which is assumed to be um, related to more high level uh, processes and interpretation of the image. Um, and um, so you can see that in the data, we have a lot of changes and we would be interested in how the connectivity changes when these different peaks are arriving. And this is where uh, the Kalman filter approach uh, comes in quite handy because we want to have, we want to inspect how the connectivity changes during these uh, events. Um, and um, so Kalman filtering or yeah, dynamic uh, connectivity uh, estimation is useful for uh, data that has event related potentials or other um, possible data sets or if you are looking at epileptic spikes or something just anything that has uh, transient events in them is very well suited for uh, dynamic connectivity um, to analyze the uh, or, or to estimate the connectivity models we will use the dynet toolbox uh, which maria already showed before um, it's developed by uh, david pascucci who gave the lecture um, before noon, uh, and it contains all the necessary functions uh, to run the script that we are going over uh, today. Um, if you are a Python user, um, don't worry, because uh, Joanne has luckily put a lot of effort into transferring this toolbox to Python as well. It's called the PyDynet toolbox, if I'm not mistaken. So Py as in PUI from Python and then Dynet, and you can find it on uh, GitHub as well. Um, so in the Dynet toolbox, we have several implementations of the Kalman filter approach to estimate the uh, dynamic uh, functional connectivity. And um, if you want to uh, read up on uh, how to use the, uh, the Kalman filter or what it really means and entails, uh, we recommend this paper by um, Thomas uh, Milde, who uh, developed the Kalman filter approach to um, estimate multivariate autoregressive models. Um, so as you remember from, from the lectures before, in an autoregressive model, we try to characterize the current values of a time series as a weighted linear combination of its previous values. And uh, one important parameter that we have to set in an autoregressive model is the model order P. In this case, we set our uh, order P to 10, which means that uh, for each prediction of uh, the next value of the time series, we are taking into account the past 10 values of the time series. Um, for the Kalman filter, another uh, parameter has to be set, which is the update coefficient. So um, 
just as a quick quick recap, what the Kalman filter does is it fits a model. It predicts the next measurement value based on what the model state is right now. And then it looks at the difference between the predicted, predicted ne next measurement and the actual next measurement. And then based on how large uh, the, the uh, update coefficients is, it will update the model uh, more strongly based on the difference between the prediction and the actual measurements. So if you have a very high update coefficient, your uh, model will be able to very quickly uh, adapt to rapid changes in, uh, in the signals. But at the same time, you are very prone to overfitting to noise and um, picking up some uh, unnecessary uh, things and, and ending up with a very uh, unstable model. On the other hand, if the update coefficient is too low, then you will not be able to capture the dynamics that are present in the signal. Um, so um, here we will select only the first 30 trials of, um, of the phase trials uh, for computational reasons. Um, and we will restrict our time window to um, uh, 200 milliseconds before and 400 milliseconds after um, the presentation of the visual stimulus. And then with this function, we can uh, fit the general uh, Kalman filter by um, using as an input the time series of uh, the different trials, the model order of the AR model we're trying to fit, and the update coefficient. Um, and then if we take a look at the outputs that we get from this function, we have a structure that contains three matrices. Um, the first one is the one that we are most interested in, uh, the AR matrix, which contains for each time point the uh, autoregressive coefficients that were fitted with the Kalman filter approach. And then we have two other matrices. Uh, R is the measurement noise covariance matrix, and PY is the predictions that were made by the model at each time step. And these uh, you can use afterwards to check whether the uh, model was, quit, was uh, fitting the data well or not. Um, but if, <clears throat> if you want more information on that, you can read, find it in the paper by uh, Thomas Milde as well. Um, so now that we have estimated our autoregressive coefficients, we can use them to compute the partial directed coherence. Um, so Maria has all, already explained it quite well, what's, what the partial directed coherence is. It's a functional connectivity measure that's often used in EEG analysis. Um, why? Because it's a directed measure, uh, so it can, if you have uh, connections from A to B and B to C, it will not find the connection from A to C if it's not really present. And uh, also, it's, um, it can distinguish between connections from A to B and from B to A. So it's an asymmetric uh, measure. Um, so to compute the PDC, we have this function from the Dynet toolbox as well, where we input the fitted Kalman filter. Um, and uh, we provide the sampling frequency and the frequencies where we want to analyze the PDC in. Um, if we plot the results for a subset of uh, nine regions of interest uh, with this function also in the, present in the toolbox, we can uh, get results like this. If it will load, yes, uh, where you can see for each pair of regions of interest uh, a figure like this, which is a time frequency analysis of the connectivity between the region pairs. So on the horizontal axis, you have uh, the time. And on the vertical axis, you have the frequency. Um, we have cropped the signal here. So that's at 0 is the presentation of uh, the visual stimulus. And then uh, the time goes on until 400 milliseconds after. Um, if we look at the results here in general, we can see that between certain regions, there are changes in uh, the functional connectivity that are being detected. but uh, you can see that they always occur very late in the signal and they appear mostly as uh, broad blobs of connectivity. Um, and this could be an indication that our update coefficient is not high enough because uh, the data is only picking, uh, the model is only picking up very late in the data that there is a connection and you don't really see fast changes in the connectivity. Now, as I said before, uh, or as Maria also said before, um, setting the update coefficient is uh, not trivial um, because you always have uh, periods in your, uh, in your time series where you don't want it to change very quickly and then periods where you do want it to change quickly. 
Um, so that's why um, we developed the stock filter, which is the self-tuning optimized Kalman filter um, that uh, uses a data-driven approach um, to uh, determine what is the optimal um, update coefficient at that specific time point based on how much the data is changing. Um, so you can also, um, in, the, in the Dyna toolbox, you can find a function to compute the stock filter. Um, if you compare the inputs to uh, the pre previous filter approach, we also have to input uh, the time series of the different trials and the order of the AR model we're trying to fit, but we don't have to provide the update coefficient value um, because it is estimated automatically by the st uh, stock filter. Um, then again, we can uh, use the same function to um, go from the uh, AR coefficients to the PDC and plot the connectivity results. And if we take a look at those, uh, All right, if we take a look at those, then we can see that uh, indeed with the stock filter, um, we are able to um, detect the rapid changes in uh, and the rapid dynamics in the, the functional connectivity. And you can see multiple peaks uh, related to the evoked potential and changes in, uh, and the related changes in the functional connectivity. So we can see that using the stock uh, filter is also already a big improvement on uh, the generalized or the general linear common filter approach. Um, but now we want to see um, how we can include the structural information and guide uh, the network towards the biologically plausible uh, uh, connections. So to do this, uh, we will include the information from uh, the diffusion weighted image uh, from the same patients. So also from the Vepcon data sets. Uh, we have this um, structural connectivity matrix, um, which contains the strength of the structural connection between the different regions of interest. Um, if you will take a look at the matrix yourself afterwards, you will see that um, the structural connectivity matrix only contains 68 regions of interest instead of uh, 72 that we had before. And that's because we left out um, the regions in the left and right amygdala. Uh, because these are subcortical structures and um, these, uh, the source reconstruction is less reliable in these regions. Um, and for each element on the matrix, uh, we have for each pair of uh, uh, regions of interest, we have uh, the number of uh, white fiber tracts that connect uh, both regions. So now we want to use this information to guide the estimation of the Kalman filter approach uh, of the functional connectivity. Um, to do this, we can use the CSTOC function from the Dynet toolbox. So CSTOC stands for um, Structurally Informed Stock Filter. Um, so uh, we again um, use as input the uh, time series of the different trials where we have left out um, the regions of interest that are in the amygdalas. Uh, we again provide the uh, model order uh, of the autoregressive model that we want to fit. Uh, we include the structural connectivity matrix. And then as a final parameter, there's a, a filtering parameter. Um, I will not go into uh, more detail because it would take us a bit too far. But um, I would recommend that you read the documentation of uh, the functions, um, read the paper and um, if you have more questions, you can always ask us uh, what it really means. But um, just, yeah, it's a filtering parameter and we put it to um, 0 0.99. That's uh, all you have to uh, worry about for now. Um, so then we fit uh, the CSTOC filter. Um, it will take a bit more time because we are again adding another layer of complexity uh, to the fitting process. Uh, but it shouldn't take too long as well. And then afterwards, we can see how uh, the addition of the structural connectivity prior affects our functional connectivity results. Uh, and hopefully it will be finished soon. Uh, so now is a good moment to just breathe and let it all sink in. Um, dun, dun, dun.
Maybe in the meantime, we can go over a bit on the question. Let's stop. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's finished. So maybe okay, let's just so. wrap this up and then <laughs> it's okay. Then we can go to the questions. Um, so now again, uh, we use the uh, AR coefficients from the CSTOC uh, results and uh, convert them to PDC and take a look at uh, what the, the dynamic connectivity looks like. Um, <clears throat> So again, we get uh, the same figure as before, but now with the new results uh, where we see for each uh, pair of um, reads of interest, the changes in the connectivity. And uh, you can see similar to the previous results that um, the CSTOC filter is able to capture fast dynamics of uh, functional connectivity. So you see rapid changes. Um, but still, the results are quite different to what we got before, what you saw here. And if we um, also take a look at uh, the structural connectivity matrix in the same subset of um, regions of interest, we can see that clearly the structural connectivity information is guiding um, the, stock, the CSTOC filter on where to find the connections or where we can uh, trust uh, the presence of a uh, connection more or less. Um, so this uh, concludes uh, the tutorial for now. Um, so I would recommend again uh, that you just go over the MATLAB script yourself, change the parameters, look at different conditions. Um, and then afterwards, once you have a better feeling of uh, the pipeline and what the functions uh, do and entail, you can try to uh, apply it on your own data sets. Um, so I guess we can now go to questions.